morning, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, how are you doing? Uh, in the Philippines, still, can't go anywhere. Uh, thank you very much for those, to those who have helped us. It, it does allow me to continue to, to make some videos. That might change a bit. Please remember to go to the subscribe button, hit the bell button so you get notifications. Please go to one of the sites where I can, through which I can receive money. There's several there, PayPal, Patreon. It'd be great if you became a Patreon supporter. That's good because it's, it's, it's regular, you know. But there's others. Buy me a coffee. Just buy me a coffee. You know, it's easy done and it doesn't cost you much money. On with the show. And this is about how uh, non-homosexual transitioners right? Male to feminine. And now, in fact, uh, fashionista transgenders um, appropriate HSTS identity. Um, and they use this, one of the things they do is they use the trans studies. And we're going to look at one example. There are many of these and you'll find them on my site. I'll put the link uh, in the text box, but you just go to rodfleming.com and go to the links tab and you'll find it. It's easy. Um, we're going to look at, in particular, the Simon and Lages study, but there were many others, Rometty, uh, Savage and Arbor. There's loads, there's just loads of them um, saying the same things. And of course, the Guillemon Review, which is definitely worth reading. And again, I'll put the link to that. Now, the, uh, the Simon and Lages was actually done in 2013, and I'm going to have to read this. So I know you hate it, but I'm going to have to because this you couldn't possibly remember. Uh, this, this was done in 2013 and it looked at the, the brains of homosexual aspiring transsexual males and females who reported to a gender clinic, right? So first thing, these were not yet transitioned. These were in the process, they wanted to do it. And they had not had any hormonal treatments, right? The, the study um, organizers were very careful to try and screen out this sort of thing because we do know that it's a, it's a bit of a grey area, but there is certainly evidence that uh, HRT can actually affect a person's sexuality and it can affect other parts, you know, it affects you physically, it may also affect your brain. So they, they took people who had not yet started HRT, right? And had, who had, had, had not had any hormonal treatment. Um, the question the research team wished to address was the existence of any differences between transsexual and non-transsexual brains. Okay. Their stated reason for selecting homosexual transsexuals was to avoid clouding the issue with a sample of mixed, mixed sexual ori orientations. Absolutely. It, it, this is what always happens. You know, the, the studies which conflate uh, non-homosexuals and homosexuals are completely worthless. You might, you might as well not do them. They're a total waste of time and money because you're trying to assess two completely different types using the same criteria. I mean, it's, it's like taking a, a horse and a cow and saying, well, you know, they're the same. Well, they obviously aren't. And so given Blanchard's typology, which they followed as the science is based on Blanchard's typology, um, only homosexual, transsexual individuals were included. And the study also controlled for possible influence of external hormones by looking at subjects who hadn't taken any, as we said. The study found the following, and this is where it gets tricky, so get your listening gear on. <laughs> in its sample of homosexual transsexuals, it said, we found that transsexual subjects did not differ significantly from controls sharing their gender identity, but were different from those sharing their biological gender. And to explain that, what that means is that those in the transsexual group, um, well, they considered themselves to be women. They, they, their identity was, we are a woman, we are women. But it was different from males, right? So they were different from males, right? took the, the basket of males, this lot are different. That's the first thing. Uh, in the following parameters, their, reg their original GM volume of several brain areas, including the left and right precentral gyri, the left postcentral gyrus, including the somatosensory cortex and the primary motor context, cortex, the left posterior cingulate, prenucleus and cal carinus, the right cuneus, the right fusiform, lingual, middle and inferior occipital, and inferior to inferior temporal gyri. And I know, yeah, I know. If you didn't study anatomy, which I did, <laughs> and it was so long ago I could hardly remember, um, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Just understand that's bits of your brain. 
Additionally, we found that areas in the cerebellum are less angular gyrus and less inferior parietal lobules down here um, that showed significant structural difference between transgender, and by here, here they mean transsexual, HSTS, uh, and controls independent from their biological gender. So again, you're seeing a difference between HSTS and the sample, the control sample of males. So, so this study confirms, and the study is actually by Simon and Lajos, and it's called December 31, 2013, called Regional Grey Matter Structure Differences in Between Transsexuals and Healthy Controls, a voxel-based morphology morph morphometry study. It was in plus one. Now, the reason these things are important is that whenever you talk to AGPs, that's non-homosexuals, remember, transvestites, not transsexuals, and there's just so many of them, it's, it's just incredible, you know, and they always try and speak for transsexuals. It's become a really big problem where um, these transvestites basically say, well, they're all the same as us, you know, and so what happens to me, how I feel about life, is exactly the same as how they feel about life, which is complete nonsense. And it contributes to the, the erasure and, and oppression of HSTS. It, it just shouldn't happen. And we'll do a, a, a wrap-up video at some stage about who some of these prominent non-homosexuals are and, you know, point the finger, because they need it pointing at them. It's just appalling the way they're behaving. What they'll do is they'll take studies like this, but they won't tell you that it doesn't, that they don't apply to their type. They'll tell you, ah, you know, there's this study, ha, huh? Lagos and Simon and Lagos, and it shows bloody, bloody, blah, blah, blah. And they'll, uh, they'll just conflate themselves in with the transsexuals and say, oh, you know, so therefore I have a female brain. It's absolute nonsense. ATPs don't have female brains. ATPs are men with a fetish. That's basically what they are. Now, that sounds really harsh. You know, it's like, oh, my God, that's terrible. Um, but that's actually what it is. Through, we've discussed this many times on this channel, and what happens is that through a process of identifying the self with the object of sexual desire, they come to fetishize both a presence in their own minds, right, a sexual target which, and a romantic target which remains inside their own heads, which is called the ETLE, which they become fixated on, and then they become fixated on their own body, either as a whole or in parts which is partial autogynephilia, and there's loads of it, there's loads of it. Um, men who like to be pegged, right? They're, they're exhibiting partial autogynephilia, and in this case, it's um, probably an interpersonal and behavioral form, because they want to feel what a woman feels when she's being in bed with a man. So they have fetishized a part of their body, in this case the anus, as a, um, a female object of desire. And it just goes on and on and on. Some of them, it's, they don't have that, but you must have heard of Jessica, sorry, Jonathan Jessica Yaniv, um, who has um, physiological ATP, and uh, she's quite complete, actually. She's not really partial. Um, likes to use anti-liners and pee in them, and that sort of thing. And yeah, a lot of it is very icky. It's really borderline stuff. And that's one of the reasons why, I think that's one of the reasons why AGPs really hate the fact that they've been identified. Because a lot of what they actually fantasize about is stuff that they know other people would be really quite shocked by. Whereas, you know, an HSTS just wants a nice big cuddly man with lots of hairs um, who can sort her out on a regular basis. Just like any other girl, like her. You know, it's not, and take care of her, put a roof over her head, you know, and, and feed her and, and just be nice to her. That's all she really wants, and treat her like a girl. That's all she really wants. She's not, um, she's not fetishizing particular behaviors or particular parts of her body. It's a real classic AGP thing, that. But they don't like to talk about it. They, you know, if uh, the, I saw a while ago, and I'm, I'm going to not try to ramble not too much today, okay? A little while ago, and this was uh, an AGP. It's amazing what you stumble across on the internet, believe me. And sometimes you can't unsee it, you know? You really can't. It's just that bad. And this person was selling, well, let's just say he had been selling personal toys, right? And you could buy them in either a pristine, which he'd used. This is the point. They were used, right? And he was selling them. 
a significant amount of price. And you can actually buy them in a clean condition or as they came out, right? I'm not going to go any further than that. And this was an AGP, you know, the wig, the dress, the whole bunch. That's the sort of thing they don't want people to know about. They don't want you to know that that sort of thing is really central to the whole uh, non-homosexual AGP thing. Now, I'm not saying they're all like that. There are some AGPs, some non-homosexual transitioners, who are perfectly fine. You know, they're perfectly decent people. The trouble is, there are an awful lot of ones who are very... who most people would find that their practices were, if not offensive, at least weird. Okay? So this is how this, this particular group, this non-homosexual group, one of the ways that they use to try to erase and, and colonize the HSTS identity, because there's a, a major problem with the HIPPs, because they consider that that HSTS is superior, that that's like, you know, that's the gold standard. Which is not a comparison I've ever made. Um, my view is that, you know, it's, it's practically impossible to relate, relate on a personal level to a, an AGP, unless you happen to be AGP yourself. But uh, HSTS are just women, you know, and so they're very easy to get on with, you know, and they, they have moods and they have blue days and they have, you know, great days and they have all the things that you expect a girl to have. They're just normal, they're just ordinary. And so they're easy to get on with. Uh, AGPs are a damn sight more dark and difficult, believe me. Uh, so I'm not making a value judgment about this, but the AGPs themselves make a value judgment by saying, well, we don't want to be considered to be autogynophilic or uh, non-homosexual because actually that's inferior to HSTS. HSTS are the, the rank of us and we want to be there. So since they cannot possibly be there, um, what they do is try to erase HSTS. And they're gonna to have to stop because the things are getting completely out of hand now. Really out of hand. Which I'll come to.